All right, all right, all right. We are back, and we have Jeff Booth with us. Let's pull Jeff up real quick. Jeff, how are you? Great, and good to see you, Pump. Absolutely, great to see you as well. Um, before we get started, maybe let's just remind folks, you have a great framework of looking at legacy, uh, inflation, deflation, uh, kind of intersecting with technology forces. So maybe just remind everyone kind of how you view uh, the macro structure, the market structure of uh, inflation and deflation. <laughs> Um, sure. Uh, we're going through a phase transition in markets um, and things won't look the same on the other side of that. Um, and, and it's driven by technology. Technology is um, exponentially trying to reduce cost um, and is moving faster and faster into everything around us. We vote our time with things that get cheaper and more effective. So we vote for things that give us more value. Yet the market is designed the exact opposite way. The market is designed to make prices rise forever. And so that credit-based system that we live in, that we measure everything by, housing, everything else, is, is, is up against a new reality that central bankers don't understand. And so, or if they understand it, there's nothing they can do about it um, because technology wants to essentially give us more for less. And, and that's the opposite way of our, the way that our financial systems are designed. When you think about a great example of technology trying to give us more for less, is there one or two examples that you're like, okay, this is a great way for people to wrap their head around that idea? Well, look at your phone like you, um, <laughs> and, and look at everything on your phone. Right. The um, you look at your camera on your phone. Look, at, we don't pay for uh, photographs anymore. We get abundance, billions of photos, trillions of photos that are free. Um, we used to pay for a distribution network, photography, take a couple photos and say and develop them a month later and say, oh, those were wrong. Today, we get that abundance for free. I mean, it's not just phones. It's music. It's, it's not just uh, photos. It's music. It's every everything on your phone. So look at every app on your phone. And it's a perfect example. Um, but there's many others. Why do you think? Why do you use Google? Why do you use Amazon? Why do you use all of these? Why do you use all these services? Because they give you more for less on a compounding or exponential scale. When you think about um, kind of the central bank actions, I think it was very clear to folks, hey, whenever there is some sort of market downturn um, or some sort of economic uh, crisis, they basically have two tools, right? They've got the ability to manipulate interest rates. They've got the ability to uh, leverage quantitative easing or, or the creation of money. And then there's obviously fiscal tools that could be used as well. Uh, now that we are, call it 18 months or so uh, from the official end of the COVID um, recession, so, so not talking about the health crisis, but the economic crisis itself. Um, what's your general take on the actions that were taken and then kind of where we find ourselves today? Um, <clears throat> general take is, uh, and, and, and this might surprise a bunch of people on your show, but my general take is um, that the Fed and rest of central banks around the world are trapped. Um, they, they cannot stop. So if you, if you allowed deflation to take place today, um, on a credit-based system, you would have an unwind of epic proportions. Every bank would fail, every institution would fail, and you would have you would have societal collapse on the other side. And so, when you see, um, and, and and so now, that doesn't change the fact that technology is making is trying to drive more for less. It just changes the fact that we're too late to save the existing system. And so, so the facts are technology wants to give a, make our time more valuable. Why do you, you use technology? Why do you think every business uses technology? And the facts are also that the existing system can't allow that to happen. So they're trying to stop that by, by and, and because they, they're worried about the depression and what that would look like. So they're trapped in, in trying to essentially reduce the real burden of the debt and create and, and all sorts of policy tools to try to to drive inflation against that. Um, but what they're up against is more likely or what could happen is a credit collapse. And and yes, uh, and, and, um, and and because if they don't, if they if they actually stopped easing, you would have a credit collapse. And um, and if they if they don't stop easing, you're going to have revolution on the street. Uh, 
That's uh, the, un unfortunately when you have corruption in the base layer of money, as a buy and money is just a trade of our time, then you must have corruption everywhere in society as a result of that corruption in the base layer of money. But but and this is where it's important. Um, they're trapped. Um, and and there's nothing they can do about it because technology is a stronger force. In fact, what would any business do do if tech, if labor is getting more and more expensive in their business, and consumers demand lower prices? They'll automate. What's so fascinating is this trade off of what I'll call short term decisions versus long term decisions, right? And so the short term decision of if we stop the um, kind of uh, trend and the momentum of the central bank activity uh, and basically stop easing the market, uh, what you're saying is there would be this credit collapse, which would be um, you know pretty significant, pretty swift uh, in kind of the history terms um, and be very, very painful for uh, a, a lot of people. The trade-off is you avoid that short-term problem by basically continuing the game and you continue to ease, you continue to ease and you deal with the problems later, but the problems later aren't a uh, credit collapse. It's basically this like revolution in the street that you talked about. And so is that a fair kind of way to look at it? It's not just credit versus revolution, but it's also short-term versus long-term impact? Absolutely. It's, but, but again, if you just, if you think about every single business um, and what they do typically when they see technology um, impacting their business is they entrench further in their business. So it, it, Blockbuster is a good example that I use all the time. Blockbuster added candy aisles to their stores. When all that changed is download speeds uh, went faster and all of a sudden you could download a movie and Netflix took over. When that when that happened, it rendered the 9,000 stores of Blockbuster irrelevant almost overnight. But what did they do? Pretty standard operating procedure um, to protect the legacy business. That framework is important because it's exactly the same framework that central banks are doing. Um, in a in an economy level, an economy level, in our entire monetary policy, and that and that is having cascading consequences across society. But it's important to so it's not. I, I would say generally, it's not bad people. It's the people that don't understand how fast technology is moving and what that change means to an existing system. They just can't see it because the system is designed differently. In fact, I would say to a lot of your listeners. Um, that they too measure the system. Everything that I saw a little bit of your segment before, we're measuring the, in, the system from the system. So we're measuring climate change from a system that inflation equals climate change. Infla to, to, you can't grow forever on a finite planet or grow goods forever on a finite planet like they're measuring. So you create more monetary units to create more, uh, to create more growth, which is climate change. Um, when you think about that. so, but again, we get caught measuring a system. We measure house prices from that same system, and we don't ask the question: Would house prices have gone up if we didn't print, if we didn't hit, um, juice an economy by 185 trillion dollars over 20 years? So we don't. Again, we measure the system from the system. So it's really hard to see how a different system could operate. One of the pieces uh, that we spent a ton of time talking about here um, is what I call like the education gap, but the way that it manifests itself is uh, you essentially have this juicing of the economy or the central bank activities. And there's a portion of the population, you know, 50 to 60% of the population uh, that understands whether directly or indirectly, uh, the best way to benefit from this is to simply own assets. Don't save all of your money in cash. Uh, try to get some sort of job that they increase the pay on an annual basis to uh, combat inflation, et cetera. But there's still you know, 40 to 50% of the country, uh, specifically in the United States, they hold no investable assets and they live paycheck to paycheck, uh, save everything in dollars. And they get really hurt by this. And so we get this widening inequality gap. You had this tweet recently uh, that basically was talking about like the manipulation of money um, to ensure that prices continually rise. But basically, it creates for the vast portion of uh, population this uh, kind of modern day slavery to a monetary system. Like you can't get ahead, right? Everything keeps rising in costs around you, uh, and you're just on that rat wheel, and you just can't get off. Talk a little bit more about, um, you know, is that a feature of the system, or is that more so a, a bug that, that it's a way to have the kind of fiat monetary system, but not have this specific negative impact? 
Now, so so remember, um, and this is where I want to be careful that that a system will reinforce a, a system, and so it's a way bigger consequence. And 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 it's easy to look at people in the system instead of a system naturally reinforcing a system. I know it's uh, and, and why that's important is it is a feature of this uh, system. Inflation is theft. It's a hidden theft. And that theft enriches some people at the, co- at the expense of other people. Inflation, as you said on your last segment, inflation, the other side of the coin is wage and savings deflation. So your real, the, the wages you're getting are going down in real terms. And so when you have a small number of people at the top um, and more people at the bottom, and you drive inflation, you're hurting the people at the bottom more and more and more, and you're enriching the people at the top. What the people at the top don't see, though, as well, is the societal collapse of that creates kind of the next step of that, and us versus them, and revolution comes. So if you look at, uh, if you look at Germany um, in the 30s, same thing was happening, and who do you think the wealthy were? And when what happens next is, is a revolutionary leader comes in and changes the narrative to say, we're going to take back those assets. And, and so in that, in that environment and what ends up happening with the wealthy in that environment too, is they think they're safe because their assets are in hard assets like real estate and everything else. But those real estates are in the country that is, that is creating that inflation and those, and and because of what happens next, those assets are are off, often seized or, or 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 taken back. When you think about uh, what people can do, is it simply just buy assets, like the assets that will benefit from this, hold those assets for a long period of time, and that is the uh, kind of escape hatch for folks, um, or does that not even work? Or, or how do you think about like what can people do about this? So. Um, uh, and and this is this is where I think we'll get to Bitcoin, um, and I think that is the safest asset. And it's an asymmetric bet. It's the safest asset. It's, it, it's the king of all assets in this time. But more importantly than than that, um, it's a vote of what you want the future to look like. You, I, I think you, I think you either believe that uh, that um, it's okay for a small number of people to control all others. And, and they can print money all they want, and everybody else is a slave to that system, or it's not. Um, and if you believe that it is okay uh, for, for that to happen, who should those people be? Um, because throughout time, what people, uh, throughout history, you see people changing their minds, um, ego, arrogance, humans are, humans change their minds. And, and I would do want, uh, want to trust monetary policy to people who change their minds and create that. For, um, and if you kind of play that forward, where things are moving with AI and robotics, I don't want to concentrate that power in a small number of people to make decisions over everybody else. I would rather have that decentralized. So prices and what would happen on Bitcoin standard is prices would constantly come down. So it would enable the free market. So prices would, so the abundance gained from technology would be more broadly distributed. Yes, it is the primary asset I would own in today's market because of the safety, you can move it anywhere. um, And you're not, so if you remember 12 words, you can get on a plane and go anywhere you want. And there's going to be countries competing for, for, for capital and entrepreneurs the same way they do now on a fiat system. They're going to be competing on a Bitcoin system. So that provides a relative safety for family, wealth, gain, everything else. But more importantly, um, because the system can't change itself, you need a phase, you need a transition mechanism to allow you to get to the other side from an inflationary monetary policy, which might have worked for a long time, to one that allows deflation, which must be must work, which must be enabled with technology with where technology is going. When you think about Bitcoin specifically, why do you say that it's superior to all of the other assets? Is it uh, something to do with the structure of it? Is the sovereignty? Is it everything in totality? Like, like how do you think through uh, the various options that someone has? Maybe equities, real estate, other commodities, currencies, and, and Bitcoin. 
Well, let's let's look at uh, over the last hundred years, real estate would have been the top asset class, um, and it's the top asset class um, because you can you can lever it um, and you can pay back the the debt in money that's being devalued over time, and and so you you take on debt, then use the system to be able to uh, pay back debt in cheaper dollars tomorrow, and your asset price rises. Now and then. If you own 10 houses and your neighbor owns one, you're richer than your neighbor because now you can rent those up, rents go up and again, with, along with inflation as well. If you own 100 houses, you, you're wealthier. If you're Blackstone and competing against private buyers in the real estate market, you own more of the wealth. So, so that system, and then if you don't own, own it, uh, houses obviously you're a slave to that to that system working harder and harder as your rent food everything else is uh, is is going up so you can see the example i'm making through real estate alone that that's been the top performing asset class over the last call it 100 years um next would be equi equities but all of those all of those assets are in the existing system and being priced in devaluing dollars and that's not the and that's one risk, those dollars being devalued. And if you think that that's the only risk, then continue to own pre predominantly real estate equities and everything else, because you'll have some sort of safety in that. But that's not the primary risk. That's not the only risk. The other risk is the system collapse. Um, and Bitcoin protects against both, both of those risks. Um, and today it would be hard to see uh, because you don't have you, uh, in Bitcoin, there's two network effects. One of the store of value that is growing the primary kind of layer one, which be, would be like investing in the internet itself, TCP, IP. Um, and then layer two on lightning and such. And would pump, you know a lot about this, but, but today, if, if, you pro, if you project, if you said today where we are, people say, well, I can't use Bitcoin as a, as a currency. In most places, it's just hard, hard to use as a currency. But remember, what we do, what all businesses do, we we project our current reality forward, thinking we're projecting the for future instead of projecting the trend of technology forward and what that will mean. And what that means and what's happening on layer two and Bitcoin is you have two network effects feeding back against each other. And it will, and I, I think it will highly likely to become a currency that you can use and a span the best store of value. So in, in, in first world countries, we don't see that because we've had a system that it operates pretty fairly for a lot of years. But if you're in a third world country like El, El Salvador and you don't, even the Bitcoin is upwardly volatile, it is less risk to use that as a currency than an exi the existing currency. And so what you see is, lots of other countries starting to use this as a, a medium of exchange as well. Got it. And so when you start to think about the Lightning Network, I know that you've spent uh, some time on this. I've seen you tweet about it a couple of times over the last couple of weeks. Um, what's your assessment as to where we are today and uh, kind of why are you so excited about that Uh you know, I'm very, very bullish. I feel like I'm so biased at this point that I can't even uh, <laughs> uh, be honest about my analysis anymore. So maybe you can uh, kind of explain to folks why you're so bullish on it. Well, well just it's probably easier just to use a specific example and think about what might happen in the market, what we do, what, what you might do if you're a business. Um, Visa charges between two and a half and three and a half percent to businesses. <clears throat> Lightning is almost zero. It, so that means as a business, you could increase your net profits or you could increase your profits by, by that amount. Um, and, and when businesses are operating on the low margins, that's a big amount to be able to in, increase their, their, their profits by, by. So businesses are going to enable this and they're gonna encourage users to use more and they'll give discounts likely to users who use more of Lightning Network. And once that starts, what you see McDonald's in El Salvador, you see Starbucks in El Salvador using Lightning. So in an instant, it's available in El Salvador. What do you think is gonna happen next when McDonald's looks across the world at their other stores and where else can we implement this because we make more money? And if we make more money and all businesses are starting to make more money as a result, then competition will come to lower prices again. And 
And again, technology that empowers people and lowers the price of things is very, very hard to stop. And I, the question is, why would you want to stop it? You, you, because you're saying we can't stop, we, we won't allow this because it helps people. And so, so as a result of that, you're going to see this, this explode in, um, I think around the world because there's an incentive structure that helps people. When you start to think about the adoption of this asset, we've recently seen El Salvador obviously make it legal tender. Um, to me, we've seen something similar maybe in the past, where if you look at like M-Pesa and mobile banking, uh, there's a number of countries in Africa uh, that seem to have leapfrogged the United States, right? And you talked a little bit earlier about the developed nation uh, really having um, almost a, a privilege, right? That we have something that works good enough. And so we don't think about the cutting edge technology uh, and the need to be innovative and, and adopt that. Is that what's happening here? Is these developed nations basically are saying, hey, we're so far behind and the only way that we can make progress is to kind of make this giant leap forward. This is the best technology today. And so let's go ahead and, and, and kind of make a bet on it. Uh, or is there something else at play with uh, with the develop nation, uh, developing nations, whether it's El Salvador, um, somewhere like a Nigeria uh, that, that seem to really be embracing this technology? I think a little bit of both, but uh, but um, but again, going back to a business example, and I'll use myself, one of my, my first company, um, uh, Yahoo and a bunch of different media companies, Yahoo specifically, it was kind of tech enabled, but it charges a minimum of 5,000 a month for, for advertising. Google was free. So where did we build our resources? We built it to Google. Um, and besides Yahoo, um, the the rest of the the infrastructure look like large media empires that we couldn't afford to advertise on. So what ended up happening is what the the smaller companies, the long tail of all of the small companies, drive adoption first. Same thing happened in the internet in general. It's the small companies that drive adoption, not the big uh, big ones, because the big ones have access and they have privileged access already. They don't see it. Same thing happened on Amazon. Um, it wasn't all of the all of the stores, all, all the merchants that were in Walmart that went on Amazon. It was all the merchants that didn't have access to Walmart. So what you can see in that is when you have a technology that empowers people, wh what happens is the people that are most underprivileged or who or who don't have access to the existing system use it first. And they create a, a, a network effect that more and more users and they create more and more value in that network as they use it, which brings on bigger and bigger players all the time. If you looked at what was happening on, on, on Bitcoin and Lightning, that's exactly what's happening. And you could just abstract instead of just, just happening at the company or personal level, it's now happening at a country level as well. <laughs> I don't think I've ever asked you this, so uh, I apologize if I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. But how do you think about um, if you have, you know, one dollar, one unit of fiat currency, uh, the opportunity to buy Bitcoin versus uh, invest in the infrastructure of Bitcoin and, and kind of uh, what's being built around it versus, let's say, equity or real estate? Do you have some sort of like mental framework? Uh, in terms of almost like a portfolio construction strategy? Uh, or do you think that we've gotten to the point where certain parts of this are so de-risked that you feel more comfortable having like overexposure compared to like the traditional frameworks? Yeah, I, and, and I, I'll answer that, but I want to be careful in the answer because, okay. because, because everybody's position is different. Right. And, yeah. and I want to, I don't want somebody to just copy my position because, because Again, if Bitcoin, if Bitcoin went to zero, I would be, I'd be fine. If yep. the rest of my portfolio went to zero, I would be fine. So, so, so I kind of have this barbell strategy um, that, that I realize what, if I looked at the probabilities of what's going, going to happen, the probabilities are, are, are the higher probability is this government's going to pretend to ease or try to signal easing and they're not going to be able to and they're going to print a bunch bunch more money and that's going to continue and society is going to if you think about what 
what people are talking about today, which is kind of two orders away from the primary thing that we're talking about. And, and everybody's kind of, what you see is almost kind of the earlier versions of societal collapse happening as a result of this, um, that's going to continue. And so, so in that, I think Bitcoin is a very, very safe bet and, and something I have to have for my family because I can get on a plane and go, go, go anywhere. Um, as far as uh, lightning layer two, um, in, in some of the, if, if I said Bitcoin was investing in the TCP IP, uh, the uh, in, internet, lightning layer two is kind of the company formation on top of, on top of that. I think there's gonna be tons of opportunity in that. I know you're in strike. I think there's some incredible opportunity in that. Like, like investing in, Amazon or Google in in the year two thousand something uh, something like that. The um, that's kind of Bitcoin. I do uh, I do own some real estate. I own a te- real estate technology company. I own many many technology companies or, or uh, quite a large investor in many different technology companies. Is when I look at the when I look at all of these things, I look at where can Um, Where is technology able to provide a structural change to the market that helps people? And what what entrepreneurs, so Bitcoin is obviously a giant thesis in that because because that's one of those areas. But there's lots of other areas like that. Um, Agriculture would be be one that's that's undergoing a structural change because of technology. And the winners of that are going to provide value no matter what. So I, I typically look at, um, that kind of real estate technology companies uh, and, and, and Bitcoin would be how I'd look at my assets. What, uh, what questions, Joe, John, do you guys have? Uh, mine would be around El Salvador. So we saw that they made uh, Bitcoin legal tender, uh, went live, I believe, last week. And a lot of the people that uh, we talk to here, especially in kind of the, uh, the U.S. Uh, and other Americans, I think sometimes take kind of our strong financial system for granted. So I'm curious, uh, Jeff, kind of what your thoughts are on on the impact that Bitcoin could potentially have in El Salvador and how you think uh, kind of the technology and the network uh, and, and how it may play a role in the future of uh, kind of not only uh, the economic piece of their country, but also the individuals that live there. Yeah, and and, and that, I'll just build on that other uh, comment I made before. Early uh, early um, users of a new network that's gaining traction like this are most enriched by it. Um, and an example would be early Instagram stars, right? And it's not a really good example for Bitcoin, but it, but but if you're early on a network that's exploding and delivering more and more value. Um, you ride that value and you, and, and so try to be, try to become an Instagram star today or a YouTube star today. You have a lot more work. You have to deliver a lot more value than somebody who rode the network up in the beginning. And so, so just like, um, just, just like an existing system, the existing system, El Salvador, it was in, um, we look at crime rates, we look at everything else and we forget to realize that those crime rates are a, a result of having an economic system that is impoverishes most people. And so people turn to crime as a result of that. Um, having a system like this empowers people um, and prices come, da- prices come down as a result. And those people, prices coming down or Bitcoin value going up is the same thing. They will be, um, El Salvador um, could look like the new G7 going forward if, uh, if if people don't move as fast, if other countries don't move as fast. So the advantage moves to the, the person without all the legacy in, in a country, without all the legacy infrastructure, just like the advantage to move to Netflix without the legacy infrastructure of Blockbuster. And that that promises for, for El, El Salvadorian people that that promise is an incredible promise. Um, there's going to be it's not going to be a straight line. There's going to be a lot of uh, noise along this. There's going to be a lot of people that are going to discount how big that is. But it's a huge, it's monumental uh, um, it, it, uh, change in what they what what's possible in their uh, in El Salvador. John, what do you think? 
Yeah, Jeff, thank you for doing this. Um, I actually just ordered your book while you were talking. I'm excited to read it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I a plug. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I am curious what you think about like inflation as a whole for our economy in the United States, right? So what are the solutions that the people in place can put? Uh, is it adopt Bitcoin? Is inf is the infrastructure that we have right now a blocker to adoption? Like, what can they do to kind of help fight inflation as a whole? So, uh, so, so remember, if you don't have inflation, you're going to have a complete collapse. So, so uh, well, it's easy to talk about that. F what is the Fed doing? They're creating this worse. Think about think about it. Th this here's a twenty years ago you might have been able to transition easier um uh, and and instead interest rates went down to try to grow interest rates went down to try to grow creating bubbles everywhere dot com crisis dot com mar uh, market uh, housing crisis everything else instead of those bubbles going away we papered over those with more and more printing so now if you think about these two trends way back here when technology was only kind of disinflationary, call it at one percent a year, um, it it looked like we were still operating in the old environment, like Blockbuster thinking Netflix is not. But now, as we move further and further down this trend, technology might might be producing prices at negative four percent per year, but we measure inflation off zero, and we're further and further away. So it takes. A, an exponential amount of debt and money printing to combat an exponential exponential technology moving the other way and that drop now from a height that's unimaginable is what is what central bankers are trying to stop but i don't know if they're going to be i, I don't believe they're going to be able to stop in your last segment you talked about inflation and inflation expectations look at bond yields look at long-term bond yields the bond yields where the majority of the market is are expecting deflation and 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 so and 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 so when when markets turn and they move to deflation or disinflation what what people will look at and they'll say see the fed was right they didn't do enough they need to print more unaware that 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 same thing is driving the societal collapse and so so expect like in that environment you're going to have a lot of head fakes back, back and forth but again the system can't change the system there's nothing that they can uh, do no matter who's in power and no matter who's elected it's just all noise um what should happen what could happen is if and you're starting to see this politicians are starting to understand this some politicians are starting to uh, uh, understand this um and 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 starting to say we need to be on bitcoin we need to drive our financial system into something that can make this tra uh, transition and so you so I would encourage that, but I think you're going to see it anyways, because it's going to, if it doesn't happen at a federal level, it'll happen at a state level. And you're starting to see that. It, it, it's incredible um, how quickly people are getting a, a crash course in economics, uh, inflation, deflation, monetary policy, fiscal policy. Um, and I try to wonder uh, without the bias of hindsight, how many people knew in other places? this stuff. And the and the answer is probably not many. And they kind of got a crash course. And, and the example that I always use pe uh, with people is if I ask somebody here in the US or in Canada, you know, what's the exchange rate of X currency to another? They got no clue, right? If I said, you no know, what's clue. the what's the US euro exchange rate? The person on the street, like, what's an exchange rate, right? You go to uh, Venezuela, everyone knows the exchange rate. Right. And so I do think that there is this element of um, the faster people can learn uh, at least the basics. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to try to become an economist, but just the basics alone. It gives you a little bit more foresight into uh, what's happening and it allows you to, uh, you know, just kind of make decisions where you don't even have to be 100 percent right. I think if you're just directionally making good decisions, uh, you're going to end up much, much better than if you simply say, hey, I don't know what any of this means. I'm just going to sit here, hold dollars and uh, you know, cross my fingers, hope that it works. 
I'm on that, and I think this is what your show does is, is really, really great. And a whole bunch of people in the Bitcoin community, because to understand Bitcoin, you have to understand game theory. You have to understand a whole bunch of different pieces of economics. But if you just simplify this, really simplify this, why do we believe we need inflation? So inflation is a hidden tax. Um, and we, we say we need inflation at 2%. Why? So, so we must have a hidden tax at that our money loses value at 2% a year. Um, why is that required for a productive society? Um, so if you ask some of these questions to anybody, there is easier for them to see it or, or how about this? What is more believable? It, especially it is all around it every day. Technology makes your life more efficient, essentially saves you time, gives you more for less, um, and prices drop as a result, or prices need to rise forever, and we're going to manipulate money to make that happen. Like what, if you just ask some really logical questions, it starts to break people's uh, kind of mental models of what they formerly believed that had to be true. And, and what ends up happening is we build our foundation of knowledge and then we build on top of that foundation. So we don't question that foundation very often. And inflation is one of those foundational knowledges that we don't, pieces of foundational knowledge that no one is even questioned. And so why, why can't a productive society work um, without stealing money at 2% a year? I just don't get it. I, uh, my brothers will laugh when they hear me say this because I say all the time, you can't be rational in an irrational world, right? You can't ask serious, important <laughs> questions like that. You just got to go with the flow. What are you doing trying to actually uh, be smart when everyone else is being stupid? That's, uh, that's illegal now. Um, tell us about uh, the book real quick before we let you go. I know we're running out of time, but uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the book and the process in, in terms of writing it. Uh, it's fantastic. Now John is going to read it as well. Give us a little book review maybe <laughs> next week. Uh, but, but, but tell us a little bit about it. I, you know, I, 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 again, it, it, it turned out to be great. It turned into a bestseller around the world, but I didn't write it for that. that. I wrote it because of what we're talking about now. I looked at my kids and I said, they're not going to grow up in the same world that I'm in. I could not understand why everything around us, I sit at the intersection of technology. I sit at the intersection. I'm on robotics companies boards. I'm on AI company boards. I see how fast this is moving into every part of our society. And it didn't make sense to me that uh, that, that what was uh, that prices were rising in that until I investigated and realized, wow, we've created 185 trillion dollars of debt to the world globally to to grow the economy by 46 trillion in 20 years, and and that's why that's the smoking gun that it's getting and that and that has to get worse and worse and worse in the existing system. And so as I started to see that, I started to see this is a this is really a phase transition of of this is going to re the stat is going to be reset one way or another. Um, how are throughout history? How are those typically handled? And they're handled through revolution and war, as people turn people against other people, and to get elected. And then once they're elected, they need to create a bigger enemy, which is outside of the borders. So that's how it's traditionally been handled throughout human history. And I didn't want that to happen with my kids. So as I investigated the, this and everything else, I said, I have to write this book. Um, and, and there's, there's literally one paragraph about Bitcoin at the end of the book. It's not a Bitcoin book. It's a, where are we going book? Um, but then as a deeper and deeper, I believe that Bitcoin is the only transmission mechanism that doesn't have that negative out, uh, that that negative outcome. So 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 th anyway, that's why I wrote the I wrote the book for my kids. There are multiple people in the chat right now saying, "How the hell did I not know about this guy beforehand?" We are completely aligned in the way that we think about the world. <laughs> so I think uh, I think your message is definitely resonating. I'm putting right now in the uh, in the chat. People can go and follow you on Twitter. Um, is there anywhere else that you want to send them? Uh, I put the uh, the link to the book, and then obviously. Uh, to have folks uh, go ahead and uh, follow you on Twitter or anywhere else. That's probably great. That's why that's perfect. All right, my friend, listen, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I, I, uh, 
I know that you've just been hammering away at the message and uh, people are listening. So keep going. I, uh, I really enjoyed the book. I uh, could not recommend it more to folks. Uh, so if you're watching this, go uh, go buy it and then give uh, Jeff a follow on Twitter. He actually is uh, what, what I call a reasonable Bitcoiner in that uh, he says smart things and doesn't shit post at all, which I can appreciate <laughs> as well. You know, some, sometimes I get a little shit posting in there myself. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. All right, buddy. Sounds good. Thanks so much for doing this. We'll talk soon. Okay. See ya. All right. Bye. Thanks, Jeff. What's up, guys? Bang, bang. Thanks so much for watching The Best Business Show today. If we're going to be the best business show, we obviously need the best partner. That's why the exclusive sponsor of The Best Business Show is SoFi. They're an all-in-one platform that allows you to invest in all kinds of different assets, including stocks, ETFs, crypto, IPOs, and they even have an automated investing function, if that's your thing. So before we start getting after it again, make sure that you go download SoFi, you get an invest account, and when you make your first crypto trade, regardless of what you buy, they'll give you $10 in Bitcoin for free. It's that simple. Head on over to SoFi.com slash pomp to get started today. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope that you come back and watch more of the best business show tomorrow.